And this paper actually win the best paper award. Let's give them a hand of applause. Okay, let's go for the presentation right now. So thanks for the intro. I want to talk to you about acoustrumments. Um, this project was done at Disney Research in collaboration with Eric Brockmeyer, Scott Hudson, and my advisor, Chris Harrison. So handheld devices are increasingly being used in interactive applications beyond conventional touchscreens. For example, there is a growing class of devices that require a smartphone to be plugged in, transforming a simple object into something with rich, dynamic interactivity. Similarly, tangibles allow users to interact with mobile devices using physical objects both on the screen and around the device. However, these pluggables and tangibles require many components, including wires, circuit boards, and sometimes even batteries. And we're not the first to tackle this area. There's tons of work spanning several different fields. First, there's recent work that aims to add rich interactive functionality to fabricated objects. Many researchers have also looked at being able to add tangible functionality on mobile devices using on-screen elements, such as clip-on gadgets, capstones, and, and zebra widgets. And in the sensing realm, there's work that examines low-cost and ad hoc ways for incorporating touch capabilities into everyday objects. <coughs> Here, we introduce acoustrumments, low-cost, passive, and unpowered mechanisms made from plastic that can bring rich, tangible functionality to handheld devices. The operational principles of acoustrumments were inspired from wind instruments, which can produce expressive musical output despite their simple physical design. Very expressive. <laughs> so fundamentally, acoustrumments are pipes similar to wind instruments. A sustained source of sound is injected into one end, and various physical elements are altered to produce distinctive outputs. So our acoustrumments attach to a smartphone. One end is connected to the speaker, which emits a continuous ultrasonic sweep. And the other end is connected to the microphone, which monitors the output. And then the sweeps, we use ultrasonic sweeps to fully characterize the acoustic properties of the conduit. We could use the full spectrum of sound, but because we don't want it to be heard, we use only ultrasound. And here, the ultrasound range we use is between 18 kilohertz to 22.5 kilohertz, which is bounded by the sampling rate of the smartphone. So like musical instruments, we can introduce structural elements along this pathway that can alter the acoustic properties, which we can then use for interactive control. So here are just examples, nine examples that we've discovered as we went through this process. And full details are in the paper. So I can't go through every single one of the design firms as, as much as I want to. There's a lot of detail in the paper, but for now, I'm just going to go over a few of them. Let's start with holes. So by covering different holes, you change the resonance chamber just like what happens in the flute. So you can see these two different uh, types of acoustrumments, one that has two holes and one that has five holes. And you can just look at the signal um, in its resting form that they look distinctively different. And so by covering these different holes, you actually just uh, uh, change the resonance of the chamber, which you can then use for input. So ne next, let's look at tubling as another design primitive. So similar to a trombone, Adjusting the length of the tube here, this is something that you can adjust in our acoustic changes the characterization of the signal. So you can see in the graph on the right, um, one that has a shorter tube length and another that has a longer tube length. And you can see the signal in the middle is actually super distinct. There's like a little dip down there. And you can use this to distinguish the different uh, length configurations of the acoustic. So as a final example of looking at design primitives, Let's look at something relatively more complex, like a cavity. So you can think of cavities like the body of a guitar, where its shape and volume affects how sound resonates within. So on the top, you can see a narrow, how a narrow cavity produces distinctive valleys on the signal. So at the top, you have this cavity that is tapered going up, and you see that little dip, that little valley 
on the signal. And then at the bottom, you have a, a cavity that's just a straight, straight through path, and you can look at the signal, it's very distinctive. So in a lot of ways, uh, the resonance of the, of the actual <laughs> device or the acoustromic is sort of like very closely related to its physical properties. And this is great because you could use, the, you could use this for input. So here you can actually see a raw live signal. Notice how only small, small parts of the signal change. You look at it in the middle. Uh, for example, on the left hump, you see how the signal deforms when it's squeezed in either direction. And you can see just squeezing in different directions, you can actually notice that it has different acoustic properties. And so we can also combine different primitives together using parallel routing. So you have two pipes uh, going through together to increase the channel bandwidth. And you can have modular insertions. So these are little modules that you can insert or remove into the acoustic pathway. So this turned out to be really useful, uh, a very useful capability for prototyping the acoustics. So what we did was when we built this, just have these little pluggable, mini pluggables that we just plug in and then we could adjust and like test how well that physical property can affect the signal in general. It turned out to be really, really useful. Again, by combining the design primitives that you saw earlier, those are only nine, but there's more that you could do. Um, you, we can construct familiar physical controls that add rich, tangible functionalities to mobile devices. So I'll quickly run through videos demonstrating each of these mechanisms. So we can build rocker switches using our blockage primitive, uh, which stops or permits the flow of sound. So similar to a rocker switch, valves also implement blockages, but it uses a rotational mechanism. We can also build multi-turn knobs, which is essentially a screw that adjusts the size of the cavity. We can have sliders, which also uses cavities to alter the acoustic output. This can also be used to create pressure sensors. As you can see, we can implement multiple mechanisms from one design primitive. We can also build tilt sensors. Here we have a ball that moves around that little branch at the base. And here we have a rotary encoder, which leverages blockages, parallel routing, and tube differentiation through holes or structured filters. So let me go through the implementation details really quickly. So again, the frequency suites that we use here will range from 18 kilohertz to 22 kilohertz. We used SVM and made it run on an iOS. And then the mechanisms we used were printed on an object uh, Connex 263 d printer. So how accurate can acoustics be? As you've seen in these videos, the signals are pretty stable and distinctive. But to further test the accuracy of our approach, we ran a couple of user studies. All tests were done live. So for classification, our system can achieve up to 99% accuracy for binary mechanisms like switches. For regression models, for example, turn knobs, we were able to achieve continuous sensing within 3% error of the train values. Also, further, we tested for noise robustness, right, because this is using acoustics. So we subjected some of our demo applications into a noisy environment and ran it for like a full hour and changed its different states. So across that entire test, only one misclassification was detected garnering a false positive rate of less than 0.01%. Our technique is fairly robust to noise because it is an enclosed tube, so it, protects, uh, it is being protected from sounds uh, external. The full evaluation details are on the paper. Okay, so like all approaches, there are pros and cons to acoustics, so I'll go through them really quickly. First, one of the major limitations of our approach is crosstalk. As more structural elements are introduced, their effect on the overall signal diminishes. But in the future, devices with higher sampling rates, as well as signal modulation techniques, can mitigate crosstalk effects. Second, um, since we utilize the speaker for sensing, our technique impedes with how users regularly use their mobile devices. So one possible solution is to incorporate silence detection and interweave ultrasonic sweeps in quiet portions of playback. So we actually, if you, if you look at our, one of our demo applications in the alarm clock, we utilize this technique where it, during silent pauses of the beep, that's where we insert the ultrasonic sound, and so we could uh, basically uh, multiplex the different uh, 
signals and then still be able to get uh, some sensing out of it. Also, finally, because we, we use near human uh, hearing ultrasound around 20 kilohertz, some people are still sensitive to that. Um, just as, as an anecdote, when I was doing this research at Disney, one of the interns was just like, why is it so loud? There's so much going on. I'm like, oh, that's why she can hear ultrasound. Uh, so it was like kind of like a, like a wake-up call in some sense. But um, So we would need to move to a higher frequency range in the future because, again, sub-20 kilohertz frequency is uh, still audible. But um, if you move to a higher range in the future, um, you, you could shift that to something that is super inaudible. Um, in fact, this is, what you, you, this is what cars uses for their bumper sensors, uh, which is around 40 kilohertz ultrasound. And then I just want to quickly talk about mass manufacturing. The mechanisms and the apps that you're going to see were here were 3D printed, but our technique is not specific to 3D printing. Uh, in fact, we can leverage mass production techniques such as injection molding or casting or off-the-shelf components uh, or machining even to drive the further drive costs down. Okay, so you've seen how we can construct mechanisms based on design primitives. But on top of these, we can create end-user applications that utilize one or more primitives. So this is Yakamo, or interactive character, which uses soft cavities, proximity, and branching to bring life to what would have been a static character. So here you, you, it can detect that there's an object proximate to its, to its hand. When you remove it, it re uh, detects that. You touch its head, it does something else. And when you poke its tummy, here we go, um, it reacts to it in a very nice fashion. And so here's another example, an alarm clock. Some of you may have seen it in the live demos that we did in the interactivity last Monday. So the alarm clock utilizes a switch to turn the alarm off and on, and a soft chamber which functions as a snooze button. So here, the snooze alarm is going, and then you press the snooze, and then here's where we interweave the ultrasound. So the other thing to notice here is that um, the, acoustic, the phone itself can detect when you plug the phone in because that's just its own, like, it, it can sense that as an ID. So there's two things happening here. It can know that it's plugged into a, a specific acoustic and then it can run like an app based on that specific acoustic which is kind of cool. We can also use a smart case, for example, which uses flexible tubing to differentiate several gestures and modes, um, such as like on hand, grip, or a camera pose or going back to the table. Or a toy car that uses multiple rotary encoders as well as notch filters to determine the speed and direction of its two wheels. And here's a final example for mobile VR interaction, like those <laughs> in Google Cardboard. So here we use different buttons on the side um, for additional input. So our experiments show that acoustics can be accurate, robust, inexpensive, and easy to deploy. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions.